Welcome back to the show. Today we have Steve Wells. He's a global futurist, keynote speaker, and the COO of Fast Future. Steve, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much indeed, Kevin. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. I What you're doing, well, I, I think just being kind of a futurist, the whole thing fascinates me. And I think it sounds maybe kind of stupid to say, but I, I'm like already disappointed that I'm not going to get to play with the stuff that's going to come like 100 years from now, you know, like, well, after yeah. I'm like dead and gone. You know? yeah. So, so I, I'm well, fast. You, know, you never know the, the way technology is moving. You might not be so quite dead and gone in 100 years as you think, but sure. maybe that's another story. I might be in a computer or something, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so before we kind of get into all Fast Future and all the stuff you're doing, maybe let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where, where you grew up. Yeah, I grew up in uh, a fairly small town in the southeast of England on the coast called Margate. It's uh, around about 70 miles from London. Okay, very uh, cool. I went to school there and uh, uh, and actually when I started work, I actually started work not too far away from, okay. uh, from there with Pfizer, um, a good old American company in the UK. Sure. I, I think, yeah, I, Pfizer, as far as I understand, is pretty big even in kind of North America. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you're kind of more kind of a global company, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. We are, we operate right across the world. Yeah. So walk me through a bit of your kind of educational background because you 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 kind of have an interesting uh, background in that. Yeah, I mean, my my educational background, I suppose, uh, was um, uh, pretty tame in in many respects. In that uh, I don't have a university background. Okay. Um, so I left. I left school or you know, senior school, or I, I guess the equivalent of, of college in the U.S. Uh, and I went straight into work. And one of the things that I always found working for a big company is that there are lots of opportunities. And I never worked in a single job for longer than four or five years. Interesting. And I also took all the developmental opportunities there were for me. So I did quite a bit of work on uh, on development in finance, uh, in management, in leadership, um, a whole range of different things working with outside institutions, um, including uh, a business school to focus uh, very much on my own development around uh, change and, and consulting. Sure. Uh, so I kind of took those and other work experiences with me through my Pfizer career and then my career as uh, an independent management consultant before finally coming to rest where I am now in fast future. Okay, so how did fast future become a, a reality for you? Because for me, I think the stuff you guys are publishing is is really quite fascinating. Well, I, I actually I actually kind of hooked up really with um, uh, with Rohit Tulwa, my, my okay. current business partner, partner while I was at Pfizer. Um, I was actually his client. He came in and helped oh, to help with some scenario work. And I was always interested in how we use aspects of the future, trends and so on, to help us think about within the organization how we develop strategy. But the very structured approach to futures actually really grabbed my imagination. Anyway, a few years later, I, I'd left Pfizer. I was working independently. I'd done some bits and pieces of work with Rohit. Sure. It was around about early 2015. And he said to me, look, I've got an idea for a book. Uh, I want to do a book about the future of business, and I want to invite 25 to 30 people from around the world to contribute to the book. Okay. Uh, and neither of us had been involved in publishing, so we thought, why not? Uh, <laughs> so in the end, we, end, we, we ended up with uh, over 60 contributors to the book. Wow. We had, in actual fact, we had over 90 interests of, uh, of, of writing with us. Uh, but we, we tailored that down, we edited the book, we brought it to market, uh, and over the course of time since we actually launched it, 19 weeks after we put the, uh, you know, after we, we kind of formed what we wanted to do, after we had the proposition together, uh, we, we dispatched nearly 10,000 copies of that book. Wow, that's great. And in, increasingly what we found is a really strong connection between some of the research that both we and our writers are doing okay. and those areas of interest to people that um, have become our clients over one, re one way or another. And particularly with the development of keynote, pre keynote speeches and presentations, both for corporate clients but also for big public events. So that formed the core of the business that we're now operating in Fast Future Publishing. So we do these keynote presentations all over the world and we publish books about the future. Interesting. And more and more what we're finding is the content for our keynote presentations is coming from the books that we publish. 
We do one other thing. We do some con uh, strategic consulting. Cons I can't say it now, <laughs> but I can do it. Strategic <laughs> consulting sure. for clients um, uh, all around the world. That's not such a big part of what we do. It's a very interesting part when we get the right kind of uh, project. Sure. But what, what, you know, our passion really lies in trying to understand through research some of the trends, the issues, the drivers that we're seeing in the future, and then helping people to think about, so what might that mean for us? How might we deploy new and emerging technologies, for example, to help humanity achieve a very human future? Sure. No, I, I, it's, fast, it's fascinating to me. So walk us through some of those ideas that you guys cover in the books that you guys have published. Well, our most recent book is called The Future Reinvented. And, and what we're looking at there is a plethora of different drivers that we're seeing starting to emerge in the environment. And we're starting to try to work out some what does it mean for us? What does it mean for life? What does it mean for society? What does it mean for business? And those trends, to some extent, are the same traditional trends that people have spoken about in the past. So things like uh, new ideas around the economy, things like new business models, the way that demography is changing, the increasing urbanization of our world. But increasingly, we're also seeing the role that disruptive technologies are starting to play in that. We're starting to see things not just like AI, which is, of course, is so fashionable at the moment and it, it is just on everyone's lips. But other technologies like 3D printing, which have been around for quite a while, and we're starting to realize how radically disruptive disruptive and new ways of manufacturing could be. They don't just impact the, the sector that we're manufacturing in, but potentially they, are, they impact other sectors like logistics, supply chains, um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and related and other sectors of the economy as well. But I think for me, one of the really interesting things is, is what does all this mean for our collective mindset, both in our organizations and society more generally? Because what we're actually seeing is a manifestation of increasing uncertainty. Sure. We're seeing notions of exponentiality, the pure pace and scale at which things are changing nowadays. And, and, and I think this, this issue of mindset, this issue of what do we do about uncertainty, what do we do about exponentiality, really plays into what I think is a societal challenge and not a technology challenge. So what do we do as a society to embrace these technologies? How do we make sure that the right regulations are in place to ensure that humanity prevails and not the machines? Sure. I hesitate to say that because, you know, I, I don't want to kind of create some dystopian picture um, of the world. But when you have people like Stephen Hawking, as he did a few years ago, talk about, about the potential danger of artificial intelligence and what it might mean if allowed to develop unchecked to society, then I think we have to take some notice. But we are at a tipping point, I think, where if we have the right leadership skills, not only do we help people in and outside our organizations through the transition to an increasingly digitized society, but we're also able then to make sure that collectively across society, we make the right choices about the regulation, the use and the deployment of really disruptive and potentially incredibly powerful technologies like artificial intelligence. Sure. The, the other thing that's fascinating to me about the whole space is I think people always think of it as like robots are taking over everywhere and they're just going to like murder us and everything's just like the world's just going to blow up, right? But I think just to like bring it back to a little bit of reality is it's already happening and people use this stuff in their daily lives and they just don't realize it yet. It's like your phone does this, like your iPhone has done this for years, your Android phone has done this for years, your computer has done this for years. They just call it these specific buzzwords now, right? And I don't mean it in a, like, I don't mean the word buzzword in a negative context. It's just like, you know, how cool is it that you can hold up your phone or your iPad and you get some sort of like 3D character that interacts with like the real world in your inside of your device, right? Like Apple just demonstrated this crazy thing at their keynote, right? And that to me isn't doom and gloom. It's pretty cool, right? Where you have like yeah. kids interacting with each other and they're playing this game on a table. Like that's artificial intelligence, right? Or a handful of other things you could call it. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting point you raise there because I think one of the issues that we do have is the way that the media considers new technologies generally, yeah. uh, but specifically artificial intelligence. So depending upon what day it is, depending upon sure. what media it is, depending upon what other news is around maybe, you, you have this complete swing from dystopia to utopia yeah. uh, rather than something that may be more realistic and, and sits somewhere in the middle. So having just said that there are some warnings out there about what the world could be like sure. um, if we don't put appropriate controls in place, I don't really see that happening. I don't really think that the tech companies will continue to be um, allowed to have carte blanche about what they do with some of these new technologies. Sure. We're already starting to see governments, um, our action groups, the United Nations, really starting to take some control of the debate. Sure. It's not quite there so that the media does take a more kind of centralist perspective I suppose and you know if you're going to if you're going to read most newspapers you're probably not going to read too much good news that's fair uh, yeah. so you know so so there is an element of that but i think shows like this really play into how important it is that we have a a, a considered sensible debate about the implications of these technologies and how we go about harnessing them for the good of humanity because we've only got to look at the range of studies, for example, that we've seen about the future of work and the future of jobs. Yeah. Some of them suggest that jobs, jobs Armageddon is coming and 50 to 80 percent of jobs are going to come out of the economy through to automation. And new technologies aren't going to create enough jobs in the new sectors to absorb those job losses. And you know, then we start to talk about, so what are the potential impacts for society? Now, you know, it may be the case that we see many more jobs lost in the future than we actually create. But equally, there are other research projects that say it's OK. Don't worry too much, because all these other technologies that we do see, including aspects of artificial intelligence, are capable of creating more jobs than we lose through a particular round of automation. And I think that debate and really the, the whole issue of the, the extremes that we see spoken about around these, uh, around these technologies um, really help us think, I think, about what is it that we need to do to create a degree of comfort through the debate and openness that we have sure. so that whatever way the world starts to move, we have policy and strategy in place to account for that. So if technology moves to a situation where we don't have half the jobs that we do now, what are the social structures that we have in place to ensure that society doesn't descend into some kind of dystopian Mad Max type environment? Um, on the other hand, if we do have all these new jobs created by new technologies, new sectors evolving, what are the social structures that we need to redevelop, like education, learning, training, that we see now? Because something has to change, uh, we just need to make sure that we're ready for the change, whatever it is. Sure. And I think that then plays into this whole mindset and leadership issue, which is around what are the what are the new ways of thinking that we need to adapt to help us through this transition and to help us think about new skills. How do we get used to uncertainty? How do we get used to complexity? How do we develop and use new foresight to help us think about a whole new range of resilient and flexible strategies? No, I, it, it's quite fascinating to me because I, I'm kind of of the mindset that I think we'll probably figure out how to create more jobs with this and maybe some of the kind of day-to-day -day jobs kind of, or day-to-day -to, -day to me is the wrong word, Maybe like yeah. like simple operations, I guess, is the, is the thing. Like if instead of you waiting six months to get, I don't know, like laser eye surgery or something, maybe that's a bad example, but you know what I mean? Like something really simple that we already have machines doing. If they can just like, you literally line up and there's like, it can go through a hundred people in an hour or something. Like if it can do like minor surgeries for people that you don't need to be on a waiting list, that, you know, something can just happen. I think I don't think that's bad. I'm not saying that's replacing doctors. I'm not saying any of that. It's like they can focus on maybe edge cases or other things, right? Because I, I don't think that's ever going to go away. Like I know you read articles where they're like, well, you know, a machine can analyze and detect diseases faster than humans can. And like, sure, in, in a lot of cases, that might be the case. And if it's a routine thing, sure. But we probably need some sort of human verification at some point, right? And so I don't think it's necessarily 
this this evil thing. I think it'll get rid of some of the like wait times, and I think also maybe the cost for some people will get reduced too, right? I, I, I think that's a really a number of interesting points that you've raised there. But um, if we take the cost one as, as an issue, I think that's absolutely right. I think we could well see a lot of technologies, not just AI, 3D printing sure. is another one, where we could see the cost of manufacturing, the cost of producing and delivering services actually fall quite uh, quite drastically. I think the, one of the other things that I think we're already starting to see, though, is some of these routine tasks disappear. Sure. And that's starting to accelerate in the white collar sector. We've seen it for a number of years, haven't we, in, in more yep. manual, be that farming, um, totally. be that in the robotic manufacturing of cars, you know, a, a, a two examples. We're starting to see that pop into some of those service sectors now, including fairly traditional sectors like legal and insurance. Sure. So we, I think we are going to see a fairly significant employment impact on the way that some of these technologies uh, evolve and are developed and are deployed. I think the issue is how quickly can we build more employment yeah, fair. in function of some of, these, uh, some of these new technologies. So we might be in a situation where we have, in some countries at least, um, kind of full employment. But in other countries we might not. And not every country is going to evolve and develop at the same rate. Sure. So I think there are still some challenges around the transition from, you know, let's call it a, a mostly analog type economy and world now where we're used to making things, um, we're used to developing services, we're used to owning um, assets in a certain way. Um, and, and we're starting now to move towards a more digitized society when actually the thing of real value is the data. Um, yeah, the thing fair. that with technology that gives us the, the solution. So that kind of transitional period, this is where I go back to mindset and leadership again. Sure. Sorry to keep hanging on about that. No, but, no, but, you know, I, re I really think it's the critical issue. How do we think about people in our organizations and the way that they need to relearn stuff sure. in order to do new jobs? How do we need to make them more comfortable with the uncertainty? How do we potentially need them to transition out of our organizations into other employment or into their own business opportunities? Sure. So, you know, there's, there's, there's this kind of thing that I think we really need to think about to make sure that however technology plays out in the future, that we do achieve a very human future, which could be through total employment, but it could be if we only have 50% of the jobs because automated technology is that effective, about looking at new ways to indulge ourselves, to develop ourselves, to, to live our lives. It may be something that's much more human and related to us rather than related to producing things for people that we work for. Sure. No, and I also think too, like there's been so much talk around kind of like everybody gets like a, a base kind of salary is the wrong term for it. What's the word for it? Like a, universal base. Yeah, income. there we go. Yeah. Right. Where, and I thought I read somewhere that some, there was one or two countries that were kind of trying it out already and it, and they had kind of some interesting successes um, with it. And I, I think the thing that fascinates me about that is like, obviously, there's some people that really enjoy working and enjoy what they're doing. And there's others that can't stand it and kind of everywhere in between. And like, if you were given that opportunity, where you basically just had everything covered for you, and you could live your life, you wouldn't necessarily have everything and you just kind of maybe get by. But if you didn't have to work, and you had all this free time, I, I think some people would really enjoy that, right? Like, or, or choose that option. This, I mean, it was, was starting to touch on some things that we've done some recent research and, and, okay. and some and, and some thinking about um, in terms of how this might play out in the future. And I think universal basic income or universal basic services sure. could be a really interesting way to uh, to take up that that slack, if you like, in, um, uh, in in the in the working economy. So maybe there is a baseline. Um, allowance that people have from the government but maybe it's not just about money maybe that is a about access to services sure. maybe it is or it isn't means tested um, do I actually need the money or do I need to be able to travel so maybe yeah. what the government does it provides me with certain amount of credits to travel maybe it provides me with a certain amount of credits to retrain um, sure. Maybe it provides me with a certain amount of credits to access utilities, and utilities is increasingly now about access to technology as well. Sure. So, you know, what are the things that we need to function to allow us to make those choices that you just outlined? Sure. Because 
perhaps this very human future that's very automated does provide us, if we don't have the number of jobs that we have now, for people to make those kind of choices. Do I want to work? Do I not want to work? Um, if I'm not working, what are the things that keep me occupied, that stimulate me as a human being, as sure. a person, to continue to develop my interests? So we yeah. might have people that are forced out of work through automation, but we might have people that volunteer to come out of work, which of course potentially creates opportunity for other people to, to, to work. So maybe these new automated um, processes, automated systems, things like artificial intelligence, actually help us as a society take more control and take more choice, take more personal responsibility over what we choose to do. Sure. Well, and I think in some cases, we've already had certain kind of free services as a society already. And I think the best example of that, I think that most places on the world have is like a library, right? Like, yeah, or it's like, it's free, or it's pretty inexpensive, right? And like, I'm sure at some point, like, at least in the city I live, it's free. Now you can get a library card for free. And obviously, like, they have books and movies and DVDs and CDs, and it's online. And, you know, and it's actually pretty decent, right? So we already have some of these systems in place that are kind of free or pretty inexpensive for the entire population of the city, right? But 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 here's the challenge across the world. Okay. Healthcare is free. Sure. Healthcare in the UK at the moment yeah. is free at the point of need. So sure. as ter in terms of a universal basic service, the UK has healthcare that, that pretty sure. much meets what you would imagine would be a universal basic service. Sure. Where's the US on that particular? That's fair. Yeah. And Canada is similar to the UK. So, Not as good, I don't think. But, but, but you know, yeah. the, the, here's the issue. We talk about some of these things in the round. Uh, and different countries are at different stages of sure. social development, where social development, you know, I'm, I, I'm defining that as access to something that we might call universal wow. basic services. Sure. And, and I think these services then, if we do start to provide them, you know, the jury is still out on how we actually fund them. So yeah. is it just the same sum of money that we already have um, in the social care systems across the world? If it isn't and it costs more, how do we generate the tax revenue That's at the true. national level in order to fund that? So there then become a number of choices. Do we penalize those businesses that use automation compared to those businesses that employ people? Yeah, interesting. But do you want to do that and destroy the national competitiveness of, say, the UK economy? Sure. Because you can go and make more money from your automated systems by creating those products and services in the US, in Europe, in South Africa, you know, wherever it might be. So there's a really interesting challenge, I think, in both how different countries develop at different rates, how the different technologies are employed, what are the criteria by which we tax people and businesses, but continue to recognize and reward innovation? Yeah, it's it's going to be I've, fascinating. I've no answers, by the way, just a whole bunch of new questions. <laughs> no, I 100% I find it completely fascinating. So, But sadly, Steve, we're out of time. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and all the books that you guys have written? Well, we're, we're up to four books now. The fourth one is uh, The Future Reinvented. You can get all information about the books on our website, which is fastfuture.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, so, you know, find me there. Hit me up. We can have a chat and uh, see where we go from there. Perfect, Steve. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. And a good rest of day to you as well. Thanks right. ever so much. Thanks. Okay, bye.